One of the hottest button issues today in the dental world is corporate dentistry. Dental service organizations have taken the dental world by storm. Backed by institutional investors in private equity, they have seemingly limitless funds and appetite to buy up the most profitable and biggest dental practices. Corporate dentistry is one of the most influential factors contributing to the escalation in purchase prices for dental practices. And there are tons of horror stories flowing out there of new grad dentists being pressured to increase their production per hour or even worse, overtreat patients. At the same time, because they're often large and very busy practices, they offer potentially very lucrative opportunities for dentists who are looking for job opportunities without wanting to get into ownership. Are the criticisms fair? Is corporate dentistry contributing to the erosion of the dental practice? If you're a dentist or soon to be one, should you fear working for or partnering with a DSO? In this video, we're going to do a deep dive into corporate dentistry. We'll figure out how their model works and where corporate dentistry has come from and where it's trending towards. We're gonna look at both the good and bad influences of corporate dentistry in the dental field. And finally, we're gonna talk about how you should feel either working for or partnering with the DSO and what it means for the future of the profession. Hey friends, if you're new around here, I'm Joel. I'm a recently graduated dentist who also works at DET Bootcamp and Roadmap Prep. I make videos to help you along your dental journey. If that sounds interesting, consider subscribing. First, let's define what corporate dentistry is. So corporate dentistry is a little bit of an umbrella term, but it just refers to a group of dental practices where you have multiple locations and multiple dentists that is all housed under one corporate entity. In most states and provinces, only registered dentists can be owners of a dental practice. So the way that investors who aren't dentists get around this is they form something called a dental services organization, also known as a DSO. And what the DSO does is that it offers administrative services to the Dental Professional Corporation, the DPC, so that the dentist, the DPC, is the owner of the practice and the DSO does consulting work for that DPC. In a simplified way, the DSO will charge the Dental Professional Corporation for all of the revenue that the clinical team is bringing in. And this allows the DSO to gather the revenue that the clinical team is bringing in without having to quote, own the dental practice. Corporate dentistry happened because there was a market for it and capitalist markets will seek to exploit any potential opportunity there is. So what did corporate investors see within dentistry? Well, for one, dentistry is the incredibly safe profession. People will continue to have problems with their teeth or alternatively want to prevent problems from first arising. And so that means that there is always going to be continued demand for dental services. There also were a lot of inefficiencies that private equity investors saw in dentistry. So for one, dentists often aren't great business people, nor do many of them want to be. And so that means that corporate dentistry saw an opportunity to create better efficiencies, whether that's focusing on a hub and spoke model. So you have a centralized head office and all of these peripheral spoke clinics. So a lot of the administrative costs could be centralized and spread over many practices instead of just one, lead to greater efficiency. You also have an opportunity when you own many dental practices to have better negotiation power with vendors. So that means you can negotiate better contracts on both materials, uh, leases, marketing opportunities. A single dentist with a single office doesn't have the same bargaining power as a dental chain that has over a thousand dental locations. So all of these factors led to DSOs being typically more profitable. Additionally, a very common technique in private equity is to buy a bunch of individual businesses, roll them up into one entity, and then sell it to a different investor. And there was a great opportunity in dentistry to do so, whether it be Aspen Dental, which has grown to over 800 locations, or Heartland Dental, which has over 1,000. By pooling a bunch of dental practices together, the gross net revenue for all of these dental practices can be quite high. And this leads to an opportunity for their investors to get their exit and their return as they sell this group of practices. So what are the trends in corporate dentistry? As the model has been refined and there continues to be opportunities in the market, corporate dentistry is exploding. The ADA estimated that in 2017, about 7.4% of dentists were associated with corporate dentistry. But in just 2019, a mere two years later, the number has risen to 10.4%. And the ADA estimates that corporate dentistry is increasing its penetrance by about 1% of all dentists in the United States every single year. So that's about 2,000 more dentists every year that are associating with corporate dentists. And that corporate dentistry is growing about three times as fast as the dental industry as a whole. In terms of what types of dentists are associating with corporate dentistry, it's what you would expect. Currently, about 20% of dentists in the 21 to 34 year old range are associating with corporate dentistry. So that's about double the general dentist population as a whole. 
Now, there are a lot of factors playing into this. For one, younger dentists are the ones that typically are looking for associateship positions and practice ownership becomes more common the further along you go in your career. But there's some interesting questions presenting already, which is that does corporate dentistry have more appeal today for young dentists just because of the increasing debt that dental students are taking on and have at graduation? Whether you like it or not, corporate dentistry is an increasing presence in the dental field. So what's the good and the bad associated with that? First, let's look at some of the positives. So corporate dentistry has created a lot of opportunities for associateships that previously wouldn't have existed. So for myself, for example, I work at a incredibly busy practice and I'm the only dentist there. The person who owns my practice owns 11 dental practices. The practice that I'm working in traditionally in the past was always owned by owner operator dentists. But because an investor dentist bought this practice, it gave me the opportunity to, as an associate, go in and have a very busy schedule, be the only dentist at the practice. And typically this type of role wouldn't be as available to dentists as it is today, particularly young dentists like myself. The owner of my practice who has all these rural practices annually has so many job opportunities because people come to these rural areas somewhat transiently and then leave. And that means that there's always new opportunities for new grads who want to come and just dive into dentistry with both feet. And it's not just young dentists. Corporate dentistry provides an option for later stage dentists who own their practice, who want to sell it to free up some of the liquidity that they have in their practice, but want to continue working uh, maybe at a part-time schedule Whereas if they were to sell to another owner operator, they might have to leave their practice after one year or less. And in general, primarily if you're coming in as an associate, corporate dentistry does offer very lucrative earning opportunities. So often because they buy the busiest and most profitable practices because that fits their model, it means that if you go work for a DSO as an associate, you're typically going to have a great earning potential. Now, corporate dentistry stereotypically is known to be very high volume, often low fee dentistry. So there's a lot of burnout associated with it. And depending on who you ask, it can be far from ideal working conditions. But if you're a new graduate looking for an opportunity to start earning a lot of money, corporate dentistry can provide a position for you like that, that you might not be able to find otherwise in private practice. And another positive about corporate dentistry is that they can be very well-run offices. Now, like everything, it's gonna depend on where you are, but a lot of these corporate dental offices have really defined the blueprint and the playbook for how a dental office should run. And they have standardized operating procedures that they use across all of their clinics. And so what that means is that if you're going into a practice like that, they're going to have treatment plan coordinators. They're going to have a whole system in place for doing predeterminations, for scheduling patients back for recalls. My office can be a little bit crazy. And I sometimes wish that we had better standardized operating procedures like you might find in a corporate dental office. So probably one of the biggest negative effects on the dental industry that corporate dentistry has had is that they have grossly contributed to the increase in prices of dental practices. So let me offer you an analogy. In real estate, when you're trying to purchase a property, you're trying to figure out if you can extract more value from the property than other potential buyers. So if someone's looking at a commercial building, they might try and figure out how they can chop up some of the units to create more offices. They might decide that if they improve the facade on the building, they could increase gross rents by a certain amount. And so then working backwards after you've made all these improvements, what value do I think the building would be worth when it's generating such and such income? And because corporate dentistry is more profitable for the reasons that I discussed earlier, including centralized administrative resources, group buying discounts, more bargaining power. And so this means that they can value a dental practice in a different way because they're going to eke up more profitability. They can spend more on marketing. They'll be able to grow the practices more. And so in terms of financial valuation, DSOs can buy the practices for more because they can earn more from them over the lifetime of owning that practice. And additionally, they have a much larger war chest to spend from. So you have institutional investment through private equity funds going into purchasing dental practices. They often have a pile of money that they have to spend. And that means that they're looking for ways to deploy this capital, which is very different than an individualized dentist who's going to be taking out this debt personally. The next potential problem with DSOs is that some in the industry think that DSOs have compromised ethics, that they're putting profits before patients because the people who own these practices aren't dentists, but are instead just investors. And so they're not optimizing for the individual on the other side, but rather just the return that they're trying to get for their investors. 
So there's a famous Charlie Munger quote, show me the incentive and I'll show you the outcome. And if the incentive is for trying to maximize profits, that potentially could lead to compromised care. Now, ultimately, it's up to the dentist to decide what treatment they render. And my hope for the profession is that dentists continue to put the patient first because that's going to lead to a long-term positive outcome, not just a short-term financial one. However, unfortunately, there are some dentists that will compromise their principles and their morals. And unfortunately, that can contribute to these race to the bottom that sometimes people will talk about in dentistry. And corporate dentistry, if they're incentivizing people to try and increase their production, can definitely be a factor that is contributing to this phenomenon. Because of the work environments, because they're less personable, corporate dentistry often has much higher turnover. Now, as a dentist, that unfortunately is a very negative force in encouraging you to do your best work. And so compared to owner operator dentists, where they're going to stick around and they're incentivized to have good long-term outcomes for their patients because that's how they're going to grow their practices for corporate dentistry practices where an associate is only there temporarily they might not be as motivated to have those good long-term outcomes if they intrinsically don't feel the desire to do so so corporate dentistry can sound scary and does that mean that if there is an increasing presence of corporate dentistry in the dental world that we're going to continue to have a race to the bottom well let's talk about some common myths about corporate dentistry and see if we can bust some of them. The first myth is that corporate dentistry is evil, and if you go work for a corporate dental chain, that you are going to have to do evil things too. And that's simply not true. As a dentist, it's your license, and you're the one that makes the decisions for what clinical care you're gonna provide for your patients. Now, it is possible that in corporate dental chains, they could pressure you or incentivize you to do treatment that you don't feel comfortable doing. But ultimately, you get to be the one to decide if you are going to go ahead with that treatment or not. Now, if they don't like what you're doing, they can fire you without cause and just say, adios, you are an independent contractor. We don't want you to work here anymore. I think the best way to try and combat that is like any job that you're going to take as a dentist, try and talk to other dental associates that are already working there or ideally have previously worked there and left and see if they have positive things to say about the chain that they were working at. An ounce of prevention can prevent a pound of misery. And if you know who you're getting to bed with before you go and work for that company, hopefully you can avoid going to a place that's going to try and force you to do work that you don't want to do. But I happen to know many dentists that are working at corporate chains, and it is a complete myth that anyone that works there is doing substandard care. This idea that you won't be in control is sort of true. That's gonna happen at any dental associateship. So if you're not the practice owner, you won't have the full agency to make every decision on your own. But whether you're a dental associate at a solo private practice or you're an associate at a corporate chain, there is going to be some degree of autonomy that you lose as someone else is going to ultimately be the one that gets to make the big decisions. The next myth is that the hours are terrible. And yes, corporate dental chains often are open longer hours than traditional owner operator dentists. I have a friend that works for a corporate chain and he, believe it or not, will sometimes work until 10 p.m. I legitimately couldn't believe it when he told me a dentist was open until 10 p.m., but it's true. And so although the hours can be a little bit different than what you traditionally see at a dental practice, they're still going to be in shifts. And while he sometimes chooses to work longer shifts, you can decide that you're only gonna work eight hours and two to 10 p.m. means that you have the whole morning free to yourself. Just because you're going to work for a corporate chain does not mean that the hours are going to be terrible. You have bargaining power and you can dictate those for yourself. And if you don't like it, you don't have to work there. The next myth is that if you work at a corporate chain, you won't grow as a dentist, that you won't get the same mentorship opportunities. And that simply isn't true. In fact, one of the peak advantages to going into a corporate dental chain is that they'll often have corporate CE. So because they have so many dentists that they're employing and they want to offer something to those dentists as an incentive, um, and additionally, they want to have their dentists be able to do more procedures in-house, corporate dentistry often will provide some amazing CE to their dentists for free. Additionally, as a, especially as a young dentist, going to corporate dentistry can be a great opportunity to just jump in and get a ton of reps really early, which is what I found with my career when I walked into this position, that if it wasn't for an investor absentee dentist, I don't think I would have otherwise had. The next myth for corporate dentistry is that you're either doing corporate dentistry or you're not. And this isn't true. There are hybrid models. So for example, there's a dental franchise called Comfort Dental, which allows you to buy a dental practice. You are the owner, you make the hiring decisions, the firing decisions, you're working with the personnel, you get to make the management calls, but because you're a part of a larger group, you get a lot of the same benefits that corporate dentistry has, 
for example, purchasing power because of group buying discounts and negotiations with vendors. And this might be the most controversial point, but for corporate dentistry to win doesn't necessarily mean that private practice dentistry needs to lose. It is possible that this might be a rebalancing as to where the dental opportunities lie. There is less advantage as a dental practice owner and more advantage as a dental associate, but we'll see in the future as the model continues to evolve and we look for long-term outcomes. Maybe as the pendulum swings back and forth, we might find a place where corporate dentistry means that there's increased profitability for dental practices, which means that they can pay their dental associates more and it leads to net-net a rising tide which lifts all boats. That might be a little bit optimistic, but you never know. So if corporate dentistry is here to stay, how can individual dentists compete? Well, the first answer is that you don't have to. You don't need to play someone else's game. You should always play your own. And it's very easy to overextend yourself and get ahead of your skis. And so it's important that individual dentists don't get too reactionary to the impact of corporate dentistry. Now, if you do want to compete with the DSOs, you're gonna to need to think like a DSO. And that's not easy. These DSOs have world-class business people that have studied business at the best universities, have incredible industry experience, can spend tons of money on consultants and marketing, and the average dentist is gonna have difficulty keeping up. But if you wanna compete and you wanna try and buy dental practices when DSOs are also sharks in the water, you're gonna to need to think like them. So that means a constant focus on costs. How can you drive operational costs down and increase the top line, but do it at the same time without compromising patient care? We need to make our practices more efficient. We need to offer better care to patients while continuing to put them first. For example, many dentists now are bringing specialists in-house. You don't need to go to a separate location if you wanna get your root canal done by an endodontist. That isn't compromising care for the patient, but it's going to increase the top line for a dental practice, make a dental practice more profitable while still offering patients the best care that they can receive. Dentists can also think about joining buying groups. There are large buying group organizations that individual dentists are starting to associate with where a group, a conglomerate of dentists come together and then have the same negotiating power that a large DSO might have. And the most powerful force for growing a dental practice is word of mouth. And if you're doing right by your patients, if you're playing the long game, instead of just optimizing for short-term financial success, you're not trying to see what you can do on your patient, but rather what you can do for your patient, I promise you, you're going to have a successful dental practice. And that, in my mind, is the best strategy you can take. So what's the takeaway here? What's going to be the impact of corporate dentistry into the future? I expect that you should continue to see corporate dentistry have a larger presence within the dental field. You'll continue to have consolidation of dental practices. And as long as the model continues to work, dental service organizations will continue to grow. How will this all play out? Ultimately, the market will decide. If corporate dentistry prioritizes profits over patients, I think that patients will leave corporate dental practices and go for somewhere that they're cared for. However, if corporate dentistry is able to do dentistry just as well as private practice dentists, which is something that private practice dentists don't like to acknowledge or think about, but is a possibility, it's possible that corporate dentistry does become an increasing presence or potentially the majority of the presence in the dental field because their model is more efficient, they're more profitable, and if clinical care is the same, there's no reason for them not to prosper. While this can be a scary thought for some people, I don't think this means that we need to sound the alarm bells. Even in the presence of corporate dentistry, there are still wonderful opportunities for individual dentists to get great associateships, both in corporate and out, and also to buy practices. I have a lot of friends in my class and even years behind me, two years out, three years out from dental school, who already own one or multiple dental practices. If you're gonna compete with corporate dentistry, you're gonna need to be savvy, but I still think that if you play your cards right and you do right by your patients, there's an opportunity out there for you. If you haven't already seen it, you might like this video that I made on how much dentists actually earn and is dentistry still worth it or is it a dying profession? Please make sure that you smash that like button. It does a lot to support my channel and make sure you hit subscribe as I make videos to help you along your gentle journey and I'll see you in the next one.